Oh, hallelujah. Why don't you just bless that name right now? Forevermore, I will bless you, God. Mm. Mm. I'm going to bless him no matter what the circumstances in my life, no matter what my financial standing is, no matter what my relationship standing is, I'm going to give him praise. That's something I learned a long time ago. Ooh, this wobbles a little bit. Is that my praise to God cannot be based on my moment. And that's because the joy of my life is not determined by the circumstances of my life. Because my joy doesn't come from my everyday living and my life down here. My joy comes from a much higher place. And, and because my joy comes from a higher place, my praise has to go to the place where my joy has its origin. So when I get, when things get tough for me and things get hard, I get my praise back to the one that gave me the joy from the start. That's good. That's good. You know, it's, man, there's folks out there, and you and I know them, the only time they come to Jesus is when things get tough. And in the inverse... You and I know people, the only time they give God a praise is when they get a raise on the job. Only time Jesus gets any adoration is when something good is coming. Lord, bless me with a nice new Cadillac. I got to give him a shout. Hey, but friend, if you can learn to praise him, no matter if it's good or bad, but the journey up the mountain is just as good as the journey down the mountain. He is good. Well... I see all these young people in here. I feel like I ought to preach at you, but I'm not. Well, she says I ought to, so that's the boss there. Anybody hear it? Anybody got a boss in the house too? Yeah, just you? Just you? He's been liberated. He's been liberated from his presence. How about this? I'm going to start with what I got today. And if I feel the Holy Ghost moving and I feel like preaching high, we'll do that. How about that? We're going to turn to Luke chapter number 10. I'm going to talk. Uh, today I'm supposed to teach. So um, if I get hot and I get going, then that's cool. But my goal is to go slow today, if that's all right. And I'm going to get comfortable. I'm going to lay my wallet out like I'm at a restaurant. That's just what I do. We're going to do that thing. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 25. I'm preaching about Jesus today. Well, these are his words. It's his story. It's coming from the top. Um, and it's a story that even folks that don't go to church know. It's a story of the Good Samaritan. It's a good, good story. In Luke chapter number 10, verse number 25, it starts off the top like this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. The hymn is Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto them, What is written in thy law, how readest thou? And he answering, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. And, here's the key point, thy neighbor as thyself. You know what? If folks in the world, in this society we live in, would love the next person as much as they love their self, I think a lot of the problems in our world will work themselves out. All right, let's get back to the top. You remember where I was? 27. Thank you, sister. I right, am 28. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself unto Jesus, and, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Let's skip down a little bit. 34. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave it to the host and said unto him, Take care of him whatsoever thou spendest more. When I come again, I will repay thee. Verse 36, I want you to hit this right here. Which now of the three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? Well, hallelujah. Y'all folks, y'all can be seated across the house. I'm going to talk to you today about the Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan. Man, I don't know why I got this. I can just walk around freely now. I'm already down here. Normally, when a preacher comes off the platform, that's because he's got a good point. But when you're teaching, you're supposed to stay behind it. I don't know how good I'm going to do. Um, in Luke chapter 10, this is a fascinating chapter, right? Because in Luke 10... Jesus starts out at the top. He has 70 people that he sends two by two into all the cities around. And they begin to do the work of God. They begin to heal people. And when they come back to report to Jesus, they say, even the devils in the city, they're bound to us at the mention of your name. And so it's a really interesting chapter because it starts with in the field. Real fun. Because this is one of the first parades of the disciples. There's only 12, but it's a story about how to deal with people. And it comes after 70 folks are out working in the kingdom and ministering. You know, sometimes in our lives, the best way to work with people is by failing with other people before. I, I figured this out a while ago. Like, I can remember I was, I was put in as our youth pastor at 19. Probably the worst decision the old people in the church could have made. Because can you imagine Brother Nehemiah right now being in charge of this whole role? He would have some awesome youth services, but I'm sure there'll be some bumps on the way. And I can, I can remember times in which I was in ministry. I felt like some of these guys. We were sent out two by two. Because anytime you got a sketchy person leading, you always got to send back up with them. So just remember that. If you get put in charge of something at the church and they say, Hey, sister so-and-so ought to help you with that. What that means is your leadership is sketchy, and we need somebody to work with you. <laughs> but so this dude, so um, what, what I was getting to is this idea is that sometimes you work with people, and you give bad advice, and you give bad counsel, and you mess up. But that's part of working in the kingdom. And that's not just working in the kingdom. That's part of life. The best way for anyone in here to learn is to make mistakes. And just understand the grace of God will always be there for you if you've got the right mindset. If you make a mistake with all good intentions, God will bless you. It will work itself out. All things work together for the good. Okay? And not just that, he's ever mindful of his own. I'll back you up with another verse. If you're trying to give good advice and you mess up, Brother Romine will clean the mess up. <laughs> yep, there it is. But that's what's so ironic about this passage. Because after the transition from the 70 that are sent two by two, Jesus is talking to the Bible says, oh, lawyer. But this guy was most likely either a Pharisee or a Sadducee. I would indicate that he was a Sadducee based on the description of a lawyer. Because he's going to have more of uh, a law and practice kind of ideology, right? And he's having this conversation back and forth with Jesus, and he's being a smart aleck. And I know that there's a bunch of little smart... Oh, my smart aleck on the front row gave me the eye. There it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see these teens. A little bit of a smart aleck, and he's going back and forth with Jesus. He said, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? What, what do I got to do? Let's do it in, in this, this terminology. What do I got to do to go to heaven? And I done heard that from a bunch of folks. What do I got to do to go to heaven? Now, that is a very loaded question. Because I'm still trying to figure out the answer myself. Because I got some stuff I got to work on to get to heaven, too. 
And people asking me stupid questions like, what do I got to do to get to heaven is a thing I got to work on. But so he has this conversation back and forth with Jesus and Jesus asks him, what do you think? And he quotes Deuteronomy chapter number six. He says, you got to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, everything within you. And you got to do that. If you want to make it to heaven, you got to give him everything. You have to. For the young folks, if you want to make it to heaven, you got to be locked in. You got to love Jesus more than you love Snapchat. Ooh, that's tough. You got to love the Lord more than your girlfriend at school. That's where it comes in, with all of your heart. And if your side piece got a little bit of your heart, you can't give it all to him. I know the crowd right now, so we're getting it. We're getting it right now. But he gets to this point, and I got a slideshow in the back. It's going to be like school here. But he gets to this point after loving God, because loving God with everything you got comes pretty easy to some folks. But he said, and thy neighbor. That's where it gets real complicated. Because I can love the Lord, but it's hard to love ratchet people. It is. It is really hard to love people that always have something slick to say. It's always hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's easier to love God than it is to love your little kids. And I got two little boys. It, it's, just, it's easier to just be in love with Jesus than it is to deal with hard people. And everybody in here has a hard coworker they got to deal with or sometimes a spouse or a parent, or a sibling, and I know I could get an amen. I don't even have to ask you to raise hands. All y'all would raise hands in here. You can think of that difficult person on the top of your head right now. Sister Pruitt, you nodding real hard. <laughs> she got one lined up right now. That, so after service, that person that came to your mind, I want you to come to the altar and pray for them because God will work through it. Yeah, y'all going to have fun on a Wednesday. <laughs> but in Luke chapter number 10, the climax is the story of the Good Samaritan. And he says, yo, I'm going to break down this story for you, and this is how you ought to deal with people. The reason why I'm talking about Luke chapter 10 is because we at this church want to promote a culture that cares about other people. When everything boils down, I think we got some cool music. I think that uh, we have the Holy Ghost in this building and God moves. I think there's some awesome people in here that smile and don't think bad things about others. There's good people here. But when it boils down to it, this church has one reason for existence. And that is to seek and save that which is lost. That's what it is. We are here as a destination for those that are broken and hurting. This is a hospital for those that need a mended heart. That's what this place is. We open the doors every time so the great physician can come and perform surgery on whatever your problem is. That's what this place is here for. So when Jesus teaches this parable, he teaches it from this place of love and compassion towards others. Now you're going to catch my backside. Let's go to the chapter, or the first one, sis. I kind of got it up here. So when he's talking, he breaks it down. He says, there is this brother. He was on the road. It's not going. Uh-oh, that ain't good. All right, we're going to pull it up on mine so I can go with you. I'm very note heavy today. That was all the personality I have. How we deal with people. Go down to in pop culture. All right, so this story bases on how we deal with people. This is a story that has been used for decades and, and, and really centuries. This is uh, the next verse or the next slide, sis. This has been used in anti-slave propaganda in America when there was a big ushering from the north that said, hey, we shouldn't have slaves anymore. The rule of the Good Samaritan was utilized in propaganda um, it was used by Martin Luther King during race relations in the 60s and 70s that, hey, I should deal with someone uh, at the same level that I want to be treated with. 
It doesn't matter what his race is or his nationality or his gender. It doesn't really matter what it is when they come in the door. We deal with them the same way. And this is a side note. You handle people the same way because God handles them the same way. When they come in, whatever, how tall they are, how fat they are, because God loved me too. It doesn't matter how they come in. His grace, his love, and his blessing comes. And that's what we do. We love them when they come in. We show them the grace of God. And we, we introduce them to the blessing, which is the Holy Ghost. And this, uh, this law or this, this story was utilized to establish the golden rule laws um, that we utilize in modern Western government. Uh, things for this is how you deal with the poor. This is how you deal with the less fortunate. And the idea of the Good Samaritan or the clause of helping those that are in need is what helps spurn modern welfare or the system of taking care of the less fortunate. But the story has a cool base, uh, an awesome base. Next slide, sis. This guy, an expert of the law, is talking. He's going back and forth with Jesus, and they're talking about this one road. It's a road from Jerusalem to Jericho. From Jerusalem to Jericho, uh, it was about a six-hour walk. And by the time you started at Jerusalem, you were at 1,200 feet above sea level. But by the time you got down to Jericho, it's 2,200 feet below sea level. So for math folks, we want to do some math here. That is a 3,400 feet difference. So that's why it's a six-hour walk. Because not only are you walking in a straight line. So now, now I'm about to get some amens here. We went to Gatlinburg just recently. And they said the trail was about two miles, but about halfway up that hill. Bless God, it did not feel like two miles. And when you are walking down and up and down or at a constant incline or decline in your life, you get tired. That's a natural thing. Let me get you the spiritual application. If you're always walking down or struggling to go downhill and you're always making bad decisions, you get tired real quick this is a side note there there were lots of hills and crevices and hiding locations all around this route and it was a perfect location for thieves and robbers to ambush folks traveling on the road and understand this road it was a well-traveled road by military personnel and and it was a major trade route uh, or a means to travel and go back and forth they didn't have semis in that day. There was not a FedEx at an airport. So things got, they got commuted down the road, back and forth, back and forth. And this place was in the middle of the desert with minimal shade from the elements outside of the crevices and small hills around it. Next. And at this location, this man, he's walking down the road and little Levi is sitting there in the crevice. And as I'm walking my way from Jerusalem to Jericho or whichever way I was going, back or forth, as I came out, the little thief came and he knocked this guy down. And not just knocked him down, he took all his clothes off. He ripped him. They took almost all his raiment, all his valuables, and they just robbed him. It was like... It was like going through the hood. They took your Jordans. They took your pants. They took your Nike hoodie. They took your snapback. You just sitting there in your underwear. You looking around. Where all my stuff go? But my brother, he got beat up so bad, he was sitting there. Not just sitting there. He was laying there almost lifeless. But the cool thing was, my brother done lost his J's and his Jordans. But after he lost his Jordans, there were three different people that walked by him. And this is why I'm preaching this today, because you got a choice on what are the three people you want to be. The first person was the priest. It's this brother right here. Surely the priest is going to help. I'm talking about the religious brother. All he does is the work of the Lord. Surely the religious work of the Lord, all Jesus, brother, going to help you out. Let me give you a breakdown, though. My man, the priest, he could have no contact with a dead body. 
Not this cat. He couldn't touch a dead body. That would defile him and it'd make him unclean. He had a role in the temple to perform ceremonial sacrifices. He was obedient to the law and he was very devout to Jewish customs. He was held in a high status amongst the Jewish people. Let's go to the next guy. Maybe this brother, the Levite. Maybe this fella. He be teaching Sunday school at the church. He was definitely a worker. He mows the grass at the church. Surely this dude's a good cat. Worker at the temple. His role at the church could vary from a musician to a groundskeeper. He was obedient to the law of the day. He was able to touch a dead body, but he probably would have shot away from the act. And he was well regarded in the Jewish community. He was a modern medical American man. Let's go to the next dude. Last brother is the Samaritan. Now this is probably the group that I fit into right here. This would be your boy here. He's a half-blood raised through the mixed marriages. I'll give you some background. So the Samaritans, they're a combination of Assyrian blood and Jewish blood. About 700 years before this point, the Assyrian army had taken over this area. Oh, it's on my slide. Look at me. That's because I knew I was going to forget. The Assyrians had conquered Israel about 700 years before. So I can give you a history lesson. The nation of Israel got conquered a whole bunch before the time of Jesus. It went back and forth between a couple powers. If you want to know who those are, I'll give you a breakdown. Nevertheless, the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jew because of this. They were kind of a half-blood, not really fully recognized as a Jew, um, but, you know, kind of at the same time. They held an issue over required worship in Jerusalem. They felt like they should worship on a different mount. Complicated system. They possessed their own temple and religious system, and they were considered a lesser, lower class by the Jewish community. That's who we got. Let me get the next one up. Those are our three primary characters in this story. But my boy, the priest, the first one we were talking about, you would assume that this guy would do it. I need, I need somebody to play dead for me. Oh, yes, you come on. Daniel, you're first. All right, we're going to run this down. Well, I, ideally, if you come over here, I'd like to hit you first. But lay down. Lay down. You can lay down. No, I can't hit you. I already got enough going on. Last charge, I need a... Never mind. So, I see this brother dead here. They done took his J's. They done beat him up real bad. His eyes are open. That's weird. But he's bloodied. He's bruised. Ladies, trust me. He's bloodied and he's bruised. He's all messed up. He's all tore up. And I'm the priest. I'm coming. And I, I see him as I'm walking down the road. I see this brother done got beat up. He is, he's looking lifeless. He's not throwing a peace sign up. He's not. He is, he's like, Ugh. He's not doing good. And I see him, and I pass by. I said, uh-oh, I don't want to get near all that ratchetness. So I'm going to walk over here on the other side, and I'm going to pass him by. Mm, not good. Not good. So he passed him by. He does his own thing. See, the priest here, you know, he couldn't touch a dead body. So it's safe to assume that the priest, he can make up whatever excuse he wants to not get involved. Oh, that brother already dead. I can't help him. He already all messed up. But I can't help him. You know, sometimes we get so caught up in where we are and our relationship with God. We get so religious, too spiritual, that we forget to realize that he is a prime candidate for help. And I want you to check this here. Don't make excuses for why you won't help. Your work schedule is not too busy. Your personal life is not too packed with your kids and everything going on. It is your obligation to reach out and help him. You are the most qualified. And I'm preaching to the spiritual seasoned saints right now. This is you. And I'm looking at eyes. You are the most qualified to help. You got the most Bible knowledge. You got the most experience. You don't say stupid stuff like me. You are the most qualified to help. Identify who is broken and hurt and set up a date with them. Let's go out to lunch. Let's create a culture in which these folks can recognize that I'm not going to look at them and walk on the other side and not help. It's my job. It's my obligation. 
Second brother right here, it is the Levite. This is the Levite. I can preach to some millennials. Can I preach to my wife for a little bit? No, I'm just messing with you. She's a Samaritan too. We both little hood rat people saved by the gospel of God. All right. So the Levite, he sees the same dead, broken brother. You still dead? I see you still dead. Oh, stomp him down a little bit. He was at the place. He comes and he looks at the brother. He sees him and he passes by. Nope. Not today. I'm not messing with that guy. Not today. I'm not helping him. Yeah, sorry, brother. You're going to lay there for a little while. The crows is coming around him. He's getting stankier and stankier. Oh, he already stanky. He already stanky. He didn't need any extra beat-up help. He's all messed up. But he passes by too. He recognizes he can help. And he could help. He could do it too. He could have came on the scene to help my brother. He had everything going for him. Let me just give you an example. This is just a regular dude who God's just been good to. He, God's just been good to my boy. He's been working around the church. He loves God. God came on the scene. He's got a good job, a good home. But he's just walking through life. He's just happy that God blessed him. You, you know anybody who God's been real good to? They got all the personality, all the qualities to really work in the kingdom. But they're like, I just love my little life. I'm just going to do me. And they just, they love their kids, they love their wife, they love their people, but they never step out and do any ministry work. That is the worst place to find yourself. The worst place to get in this middle zone of complacency in your life, where you are more focused on your life and how awesome things are for you that you fail to take action. That's a terrible spot to be. But let me talk about our last brother. This is my man right here. He is the Samaritan. This guy right here, he's probably got a teardrop on his eye. He's probably, I mean, I'm just thinking, this guy looks real ratchet. Probably just ugly looking too. I mean, can you just imagine this guy? He's, he's fresh out the hood. Jesus done came on him. And life has been good. He saw the blessing of God. And he sees this dude laid out. Laid out. Oh, he real laid out. He sees my brother messed up. And he comes to him. He gets his wine and his oil out. And he mends his wounds. And he, he takes them. I can't pick you up. I should have picked somebody lighter. I got somebody strong who can help your boy out. Why do two scrawniest dudes in the church <laughs> stick their hands up? This is what I'm talking about, right? You know, when I said the most qualified people in the church don't ever volunteer to help those that are hurting, and I'm looking at you, Brother Joe. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the practice. He takes him. Now I need a donkey. That's what I need. You would perfectly fit a donkey. You sit right here. I'm going to have you. No, no, right here. He's the beast. Yeah, you are a thief. He still hey, look. He got the thief mindset. So he takes him after he mends with oil and wine. He picks him up and sets him on his beast. I want you to lay him right on there. He volunteered to be the donkey. He deserves it. Pick him up and lay him down. Pick him up and lay him down. Pick him up. Be a man, Joe. Put him right on there. Right on the donkey. Woo! You are going to Jerusalem. All right, you got to go sit down. Can I get the next slide? Look at that. We're prepping for a church skit. So we're, we're, we're taking volunteers. So what happens is this dude, and I'm going to just take a step out here. He recognizes that if he doesn't help him, he's just going to die. And that if I don't take the initiative myself to come help him, the next guy probably isn't going to do it. And this is the culture that we're talking about. It's so powerful to recognize that you have an individual ability to change someone's life. And most people in this room have experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost in your life. 
You've seen God's spirit, his anointing, his power work. I mean, if I had you name the miracles you've seen, we could fill up a notepad. You've seen God's blessing. Even some of these teenagers, you've seen God move. You've felt his presence and his power. And it is an awesome privilege to be able to bring somebody out of a dire situation. Set them up and take them and mend their wounds and help them and get them there. And that's your job in this room. Our job is to find and identify the broken, but not just identify it. Pick them up. Clean their wounds. And if you can't finish the job, he put them on his beast. He took them to the inn in town, and he said, hey, I've helped this guy. I want you to keep him here. Here's two pieces of silver. If that doesn't cover the bill, when I come back, I'll pay it. Sometimes, Brother Joe, I don't have all the answers for everybody. I can pick you up, get you on the beast. I can get the wine and the oil, and I can help you. But sometimes I got to recognize I got to get them to the end. I've got to get them to the end. I've got to get them to the end. I'm just telling you, somebody, this is the end where the mended and broken and busted up people come. And this is the location where the price has been paid. The ransom has been given. And when God's... Woo, this is where the grace of God changes lives. I remember coming into the church, a son of a broken down addict, following in his daddy's footsteps, but somebody picked me up. They took me to the inn, and they said, here's my money. This is what I've got to offer, but the innkeeper, he will do the rest for you. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost, somebody. Hey, you know, this is, this is awesome for me. Um, sometimes we deal with some crazy Sunday school kids and I'm looking at liberty we're looking sometimes we deal with some tough kids and their backgrounds are tough but if you can get any consolation out of all of that I am what happens when God comes on the scene I'm that when you look at the backgrounds they come from and some of us like my background Broken home. Mom and dad. Dad in prison. Mom doing her own thing. And somebody just said, come to church. That's your answer. And 12 years later, here I am. If you can just get them to the end, the grace of God can finish the rest. Because I'm living proof. I will recognize that I was dying and lost in my sin. I had been robbed of all joy in my life. But somebody cared enough about me to say, come on, son. There is life and that much more abundantly for you. Come on, son. I'm going to carry you in and I'm going to take you somewhere where you can get your help. And that is our obligation as a church to recognize that once we were lost, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, but but now I see I was lost in my sin, but his amazing grace came on the scene and it changed my life. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was too much preaching. You can sit down. All right, let's get back into application. If I feel the Holy Ghost like that, we're going to get music. All right. Can we see this process I'm talking about in application? Let's go. Let's go Bible. We believe the Bible here. This isn't just my opinion, but I want you to see scripture behind it. Let's have those verses up, sis. Oh, you have them up. Yeah, girl. Go get. When thou cuttest down thy harvest in thy field, and thou hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not. Go to the next one. Go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow, that the Lord thy God might bless thee in all the work of thy hands. Let me give you this basis. When a farmer planted his field, the scripture here in Deuteronomy said, I need you to leave a corner. I need you to leave a corner for the widow, the fatherless, the stranger in our land. So that when they come into the presence of God's people, there is food for them to eat. And every service, I say this all the time, I am so big on environment. When 
When folks come into the church, there ought to be an environment, a field reap for the harvest, and we ought to have a corner for God's anointing to move on them. Yes. Yes. Ah, let me get the next one. Woo. So you don't have to, and go back to that one slide you had up before you had the verse, sis. The story of Ruth is that in application. Anybody ever read the book of Ruth? It's a shorty. So if you want to read a few chapters and be encouraged, this is a good book to read. It's easy to read, easy to understand. So Ruth is a daughter of a woman, Naomi. Her kids are dead. Her husband's dead. They go to a crazy foreign land. They leave God's land during famine, and then everybody dies. And Ruth is a daughter-in-law of this Naomi chick, right? And they come to the land of Israel, and Boaz, during the barley harvest, lets her glean in his fields so that she can take care of mama. That's what I'm saying. People are coming from broken situations. They're coming from the land of Moab. Life has been tough. The only thing they know to do is to come to church with mama or grandmama or somebody they know. And when they come here, we ought to have plenty for them to glean. There ought to be enough Holy Ghost power, healing, anointing, God moving in this building that the messed up drug head can come in here and glean from his anointing. That's what should be here. This is a house for mercy and grace. And the law of Corbin is this New Testament reference here. The law of Corbin said that you're to take care of those that are less fortunate. I'll just give you a summary. We are, it's our obligation. In this case, the law of Corbin was to take care of your mother and your father. But what happened in this day is they were not doing that. And they were saying, I gave all my time to God. And that wasn't the case. We're supposed to take care of our elders. This is my side note. You take care of those that got us where we are now. It's important. We live in a generation where new ideas are always put to the front and the old ideas are put in the back. But every now and then you got to recognize that your ideas are built upon old ideas. <laughs> they just are. It is ours. So like my job here, and this is laugh, he's not that much older than me. I'm going to lift him up. I'm going to take care of him the best way I can. I'm not going to say I'm too busy working on my personal relationship with God, but I'm going to take care of the elder, okay? And the other elders in here. I just didn't point at the ladies because I want you to feel good. <laughs> All right, and let's go to the next slide, sis. I'm rolling through this. That's the application, but here's the importance Oh, Jesus. I'll get this up on my phone here. All right. Woo! This is what I brought it for. Who would have ever thought? Can you, can I get some seasoned saints? Would you have ever thought that a preacher would be allowed to preach from a cell phone in the church? Can you believe? Next time I'll wear a hoodie and a snapback, and let's see how it happens. My wife is going to get me. Okay, so the church, <laughs> the church of tomorrow is going to take some work. Rich people are flocking in these doors. They're not. We are not a country club, and we should not act like it. We ain't got country club money, so we ought not to expect country club folks. Can I say this? The rich white people that voted for Trump ain't coming in. That's, they're not our target audience. They're just not. Thank God, too. I know, so I guess I just got you there. The good middle class families, they're not randomly showing up. Oh, it is up there. They're just not here. And trouble-free young people are not storming our altars. That's not who we're getting. The, the poor are banging on our door, and broken homes are more prevalent than ever before. And the youth of today, they face obstacles on all fronts that you never would have dreamed of. They can access any bad thing they want in probably five seconds. You had to think about sinning in the 80s and then go get your sin and take it home. They got it. They got it. And it's real discipline. We as a church, we have to be able to relate and guide. And most importantly, we have to love the fallen. So that one day that fallen person can return the favor to the next generation. And that's where I fall in. So this is, this is just a couple things. This is what the Samaritan does here on the right column. And this is what you and we and everybody needs to do. We got to go to them. 
we got to meet them where they are, no matter how bad it is. Hey, I've gone to crack houses and taught Bible studies with drug addicts all around me so the gospel could get preached to who it needed to get to. And I'm not saying you got to do that. My wife it most certainly will not be going to the drug house. I will make sure of that. That's just not what we do at mine. But daddy can make bad decisions. So we need to bind their wounds. But before that, I'm not saying you go to the drug houses, but you go where they are. If you can't get them to go to the Waffle House and have a Bible study, go to their house. If they won't come to the church, go to them. For the love of God, please go to them. They, they need the gospel. We got to bind their wounds. What I mean is actually point. You really got to actually work with people and point them towards a real solution. Less talking, more working. This is going to be controversial. I'm going to say it just because I can. But faith without works is dead. You can pray all you want for folks to come in the door, but if you don't work with the ones that come in, or better yet, you don't try to work with anybody, your prayer will just go up. But no result will ever come down. We cannot just pray for revival. We have to get some revival. We have to. We have to. Pour oil and wine. Use your tools that God has given you and tell your story. I am a Samaritan. And I'm not looking at a bunch of perfect people. None of us are. We've got our mistakes. We've got our mess-ups. We've got our problems. You've got personalities that are different. Some of us are like Liberty. And she <laughs> Liberty has a light in her life and, and a powerful blessing that God wants to use. And I made her turn her head, so that's good. But God wants to use your unique giftings, every one of you. I can't sing. I love to sing. I just don't sing well, so they don't let me do it. But, like, I'm sure Sister Ray can minister to people that I can't even think about. But, man, I like singing. But we all have giftings. Like, I am not like Sister Brandy. Not one bit. We don't look alike. We wear glasses, but that's about it. She reaches a completely different crowd. She just does. Brother Pruitt, you reach a way different crowd than me, brother. I don't know anything about livestock. I don't look nearly as good in flannel. And you've been able to deal with her for how I mean, he's got a special anointing, special anointing. Uh, so set him on your beast. Sacrifice your personal interest to aid another. So this Samaritan cat, it would have been much easier of a ride to be on his beast and to use it himself. But he put him on it. I love baseball. I'm a sports guy. I love spending time with my kids. I have hobbies too. But sometimes you get bad phone calls. <laughs> and I say, sorry kids, I'm going to go take this phone call. I mean, I'll miss out on time for a work call, so why wouldn't I miss time for a kingdom call? Or better yet, sometimes... Well, we don't do date nights like we used to, sweetie, but we'll get back to it. Sometimes the date nights, she remembers, we had date nights ransacked by problems to the point where we just like, just come on out to eat with us. We'll try to help your marriage. We're trying to help our own marriage, but we'll help yours. Get them to the end. Church and Jesus function together. Help get them involved. Jesus, without structure, Jesus without structure is like sending a text saying good vibes. So what I'm trying to say is, if people say they love Jesus, they have him in their life and they read the Bible, but they don't ever attend a place where they can learn more about him or they could worship him or get strength or even go around people with the same interest, they're going to be just as dead on the road to Jerusalem or Jericho or whichever direction they're going. They have to come here. 
you got to get them to a place where they can learn of them, and let's get them involved. If you like to shoot guns, and that dude likes to shoot guns, please take him to the gun range. Because me and Brother Romine, I don't know, I don't know if he's got a gun. I don't got a gun. He probably shoots better than me. I'm not the kind of guy you want with a gun, just to be honest with you. But if, if they like to go shopping at Kate Spade for purses, please, ladies, go take them shopping. Don't buy the purse for them because you'll be broke and your husbands won't like it. But take them shopping because I am never going shopping with anybody other than my wife, and that's only once a year. Please do something with them. Yeah, how about this? If you're an 8-year-old kid and, and are teenagers or 7-year-olds or whatever ages you are, if a kid your age walks into the church, go introduce yourself. Hey, what's up? My name is Sydney. We the same age. We got stuff in common. We both wearing champion hoodies right now. Let's hang out. You know, just introduce yourself. And last, pray, pay for their care. Go the extra mile. I'm not saying financially, but just do more than what you think you should do. Next slide. Ooh. Oh, wow, this is a bunch here. All right, so we're going to skip through this real quick, and then the last slide is the last slide. Um, this is the qualities of the Samaritan. If you want to take any notes here, this is what you need to be. If you want a church culture that changes people's lives, you got to be unselfish, not self-preserving. I'm not worried about my position in the church or my status. I, I promise to Jesus, if a drummer comes in here, I will never pick up those sticks again. Ever. So one of you young people need to get it together. You got to be compassionate. Place yourself in that man's shoes and do what you wanted for them. And lastly, be able and willing. The man was willing and he was prepared to help. Probably because he might have experienced a similar situation himself. And last one here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse 9. Actually, I got one more slide after this. You don't be mad. No, go back to that one, sis. No, we're reading it. I done read it. I done read it. You got to go back. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters. I'm preaching like brother. No. <laughs> nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. We're going all through that. All those people, and such were some of you. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Before I ever became a saint, I was a such were some of you. All of us were never worthy of God's grace and his mercy, but he showed it. And, and we got to always recognize that I was once there. Once there. And time to go home. Uh, John Newton, this is a poem that he wrote, and it was about the Good Samaritan. We can stand across the building. Uh, we will not sing a song unless you're crying. Are you crying? We are not singing a song. Okay. How kind the Good Samaritan to him who befell the thieves. Thus Jesus pitieth fallen man and heals the wounds the soul receives. Recognize just one thing today. You didn't get here by yourself, and the next person won't get there either. Okay? When we look at folks, put yourself in their shoes and understand the agenda. We are here to help others. And you are somewhere in that process. You might be the other I'm helping, or you may need help next week. We don't know what happens, but just think about it. We were lost. We were broken. Some of us are still messed up, and we're still using this grace. And that's what they need, all right? All right. Why don't we just, I'm gonna, we're going to pray today. I didn't pray last time, but we're going to pray today. That person that you thought about earlier that was hard to deal with, now is the time to pray for them. But lastly, before that, I want you to have that good Samaritan heart right now. I want you to pray that God would open your heart right now that he would bless you, that he would strengthen you, that he would bring out those qualities that are already there because it's in the house. Everything you need to be this is here. Well, why don't we go before the Lord right now? Jesus, God, that you would help us today.
that you would bless us and you would strengthen us, God, that you would move and touch our hearts and our minds, God, that you would let us think and act and move like this good Samaritan, God, that we would come on the scene for the hurt and the broken, God, that your anointing and your blessing would be upon us, that you would anoint our steps, our words, that we could help and we could lift, God. Oh, God, remind me where I was, God. Remind me of where I was, God, that I was one of them. Such was some of you. God, bring strength and encouragement and power. And bless those, God, that come through our doors, that we would be qualified and equipped to help them see your glory, your goodness, through the power of the gospel of Christ, God. It's through your power and in your name. Mm, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.